or secret or sneaky actions. And I argue uh, three of the most important are here on the board, and all three of these are going to have really long-lasting legacies that are not going to be necessarily good for America. 1953, uh, we have Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran, who is popularly elected. The people of Iran pick their leader. The U.S. does not like that because he looks like he might be a little bit friendly to communism. The U.S. sends the CIA. They engineer an overthrow. They remove him from power, and they install in power instead the Shah of Iran, who promises to be very friendly to the U.S. and terrible to his people. Anybody seen the movie Argo? The Iranian hostage crisis? Yes. Uh -huh. It's all because of us putting in place this dude who's going to be friendly to us and then terrible to his people. One year later, the CIA overthrows a far left, so a socialist type regime in Guatemala. One of the reasons that Guatemala is still a country largely in chaos today is because of this, this overthrow of popular elected people and replacement with people that we like. In 1959, uh, Cuba has its uh, revolution and uh, Cuban dictator Fidel Castro takes over, and the CIA tries at least 20 times to assassinate him. And I'll circle back. He didn't die until like four years ago. Uh, and I will circle back to him momentarily. So all of this is going to get us in trouble later. We look at Eisenhower's really strong on foreign policy, but all these ideas are going to get us into a significant amount of trouble later as we are now all over the world supporting countries simply because they are not communist, not because we have any shared ideology, not because they're good people. Right? We go from, from, from Wilson's 14 points of making the world safe to democracy to Eisenhower's point about making the world not communist at any cost. Now the philosophy behind this is the end justifies the means. It doesn't matter what it takes to get there. If we make a world that communism doesn't exist, it'll be worth it. Whether you agree or disagree is your own perspective. But what you do here is you, is you remove the philosophy that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and happiness. You remove the idea of liberty, of letting people pick their own governments, simply in the name of not being communist. These interventions, we'll call them, these actions are going to lead to a ton of anti-American sentiment. We can no longer pro proclaim ourselves the good guys when we're here in these countries supporting people that nobody wanted. A ton of anti-American sentiment in the Middle East, which uh, still exists strongly today, and Latin America, which still exists strongly today. Now, what also takes place, before well, I just look at a cartoon in a second, under Eisenhower's presidency is the space race. Who, who won the race for the atomic bomb? We did, right? Uh, and the, but then the USSR caught us really quick. Ten years faster than we thought. It's a little worrisome. Uh, and then they beat us into space. 1957, the Soviets launched the satellite Sputnik, which leads to a ton of fear that the USSR has now passed us by in Cold War technology. If they can put a satellite in space, they can shoot a missile from space and kill the whole United States. <coughs> this worry that if the Soviet Union is winning this race to create the new kind of missile, intercontinental ballistic missiles. So shot from thousands of miles away, they can just pop out of a silo and head on to the US. So now we have millions of Americans who look up at night and they can see every about 12 or 13 hours the satellite. Just going right across the sky. And every American's in their backyard like, that's it, that's the Russians. Because now we look up and we see satellites all over the place, right? Like, look up tonight uh, and see how many you can see. There's plenty. But then, there was only one. So every time that satellite went over, you knew for a fact that was the Soviets. They were killed. So the USSR beats us to space. The US is then going to uh, speed up its plan to build uh, these missiles to build the submarines that can deliver these missiles. So it just leads to this next phase of the Cold War pissing match. Khrushchev, 
the new leader, now that Stalin has died in the Soviet Union, uses Sputnik to make the U.S. more defensive. It's the first time they've beaten us at something. He says in a very important speech after launching the satellite, we will bury you. Your grandchildren will live under communism. Uh, and Americans are sitting here looking up at the satellite like, damn, he's right. <coughs> damn, he's right. So what Sputnik does, though, is it makes Americans worry that they're losing their edge. They're losing their extra uh, added ability. They're losing its work ethic. So the U.S. government instead creates NASA. NASA, which still exists today, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, to try to get the U.S. into space as quickly as possible and also creates the National Defense Education Act. One of the first times we actually spend national attention to education needs. Saying like Americans are getting dumb. The Soviets beat us to space. We need smarter Americans. Quick, get forth some Chinese people. Um, the NDEA was created to make America better at math, better at science, and better at technology. What are the outcomes of the NDEA? Any guesses? What? The computer? No. Steve Jobs? AP uh, testing. Uh, yeah. The Advanced Placement Program is a byproduct of the NDEA. Uh, as we try to then take our kids at, at, at its outset, our kids that are advanced and make them more advanced and make sure they're ready for the world so they can help America win the Cold War. That's why you're sitting here today. <laughs> I see the Cold War. Go figure. Whoa. Go figure. What's up? Yeah, in a sense. All right, so there's a good cartoon that I want you to take a look at with your partner. It's a good one. Uh, and then we'll look at the end of Eisenhower's presidency. We only have 15 minutes left today. So take a minute with your partner, a whole minute, identify what is this cartoon's context and what is the perspective of this cartoon. One minute, go. I'll give that shit minute 30. Dive in. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. <coughs> They have all these bombs that we've seen in the set. Alright, buddy. Exactly. Exactly. Come on, spell them up, do they? No, they don't. They want them. Come on, can you say it? Bow and arrow. What do you get mad from? Exactly. So they have all these giant bombs, and what are we using to fight a set? Arrows. 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 No. You're going to miss out on the field trip because it's all the girls. 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 So they're only like using it as a threat, <laughs> but they're fighting with like, as you said, it's too. Like, yeah. 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 Let's talk about dominoes. Or the Middle East might have become part of the Oh, hey, buddy. Oh, yeah. 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 Short term benefit, long term disadvantage. What if history's kind of both times you tell? Well, all right. So this is a good cartoon because this cartoon best. Illustrates Eisenhower's foreign policy. Johnny, talk to us. What's going on up here? So, like, they're using like bombs just like for like, like image. They're not actually gonna, they're not actually gonna use them. Yeah. They're just using them like for a threat. Good. Good. We have we've invested all this money in big old bombs, and what are we fighting with? Yeah. Bows and arrows, baby. Right, but isn't this Eisenhower's goal? Yeah. If you have enough big bombs, you don't have to use it. So we look at Eisenhower's foreign policy, quite honestly, as a mixed bag. Does it keep us out of atomic warfare? Yes. But I think we, we would be uh, uh, remiss if we did not identify the long-term legacies of what he does in the Middle East and what he does in, in Latin America. Was it worth it? I don't know. We can't go back and, and play it the other way. What if the Middle East all goes communist? And then, there's, and then the Soviets have access to all the world's oil. What if? What if we don't get involved in the Middle East and then there's no 9-11? Would we be here on 9-11 if... And on and on and on. 
So on his way out of the presidency, though, I would argue he gives us his most important, uh, his most important piece of, of his Cold War legacy, and it's a very important speech about the military-industrial complex. He said, I warn America, hey, if you keep only investing in things because they are good for you militarily, you're going to lose what made America what it is in the first place. If you spend all your energy, all your time, all your resources, all your money on the military, we're going to become a very different country than what we're supposed to become. He says that our, our military spending is dominating domestic politics, foreign politics, and look at this map. <coughs> These are states, the darker the state, the more the military spending is taking place. So all around Washington, D.C., all in the Iron Belt, California becomes a big producer of military goods. Boeing, for example, uh, Boeing's headquarters are right down here in, in, in Redondo Beach, El Segundo. Uh, they're the ones putting out planes and bombers and all kinds of other stuff. So all of this money is being spent on the military, uh, and, we're, and we're leaving other things behind. I'm going to have you skip the speech, but I'm going to ask you to go back and read it on your own time, just so that I can get through a couple more things before the end of the day. So this military-industrial complex, this military industrial complex, you can make an argument, is the reason why the Soviet Union loses the Cold War. Because the Soviet Union spends every available dime on bombs and military, and eventually their society crumbles. And the U.S. avoids that problem by having some other movements in the, sh in the meantime we'll learn about uh, pushing back on the government spending all their money on nothing but military stuff. As you can see, by 1915, uh, excuse me, by 2015, half of our federal government's budget, half, is spent on military stuff. We should read that in the speech. So some conclusions. Some conclusions by the end of, by the end of Eisenhower's presidency. By 1960, uh, the American people are more optimistic. They're happier people. Americans are no longer afraid of the Great Depression. Our anxiety over the Cold War has continued, but it's not as severe. We're not worried every day that our world's going to end because as we get farther and farther from an actual conflict, it feels like we're safer and safer. But underneath all of this prosperity are these, these real concerns about American values, what's important to us, as well as race concerns, as well as racial concerns. Yeah. So 1960 gives us a very important presidential election uh, as we see John F. Kennedy. Uh, elected, of course, first as the first and only Catholic, and second as the youngest president to be elected. He was in his 40s. Keep in mind, you have to be 35 to be president, and most of our presidents have been old white dudes. So he's the first Catholic, first non-Protestant, and youngest president. Right? Um, it's the first presidential election that TV plays a role. There's a very important debate he's running against, Richard Nixon, here he's back again. Don't worry, he'll be back. Are uh, you running against Richard Nixon? And in, in probably the most important debates right before the election, people that listen on radio say that Nixon won easily the debate. People that watch on TV say that Kennedy won overwhelmingly no debate. Because appearance matters for the first time in American politics. Because now that they can see you speaking, and they can see the way you present yourself, they can see the way you handle yourself, Nixon looks nervous and fidgety, sweating profusely. Kennedy looks calm, <coughs> cool, smooth, good looking, well put together, he wins the election. So look at our election map, what do we, what do we see, what do we notice? Kennedy wins the West. Kennedy wins the West, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and look at these, these southern states are voting for which party all of a sudden? The Republicans. The Republicans who used to be never getting votes in the South are all of a sudden getting southern votes. Interesting. Let that play a role in our conversation for Monday. Even these states are getting some Dixie crap votes, some some segregationist type candidate votes, some Strom Thurmond votes, uh, running on this platform of, of segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, which is a line that I'll reference again on Monday as well. So we see Kennedy's election in 1960. 
uh, as we turn back towards liberalism from the, the conservatives of the 1950s. Now, his domestic policies are called the new frontier. The new frontier. So now we got the square deal, we got the new deal, we got the fair deal, and now we got the new frontier, presidential policies. And he wants to go back to FDR era liberal policies. Liberal in the sense of everybody gets a fair shake and the government spends a lot of money. Of course, he's going to run up against conservative pushback in Congress by the, the Southern Democrats in his own party, as well as the Republicans. Uh, we're going to be very opposed to his social reform agenda to fix the social problems. He, like Truman, is going to propose uh, uh, nationalizing our health care, get pushed back on. He's going to push a bunch of education reform, get pushed back on. Uh, but Congress does a lot under his presidency to help the poor, help the poor. Um, and our economy is also very healthy under him as well. Our economy is very successful. Our, our industrial uh, production is very modernized and productive. The government's spending a bunch of money on the Cold War, on these programs. We have a huge tax cut in 1963. So the economy's good, jobs are good. Uh, for the first two, three years of the 60s, our economy looks just like the 50s. We are continuing this prosperity of Eisenhower in the 1960s. We see aid for public schools get shot down by Congress. We see the extension of Social Security get shot down by Congress. Unemployment benefit extension gets shot down by Congress. And medical insurance for old people are all shot down by Congress. Because Congress is, is, is largely worried about spending more money on social programs. Now, once he dies, don't worry, we'll do all these things. We feel bad that he died, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I like the populists. Got. So, so these are going to be some of the things that LBJ is going to push for to get past in AJFK's legacy. But he, he spends the first two and a half years, the only two and a half years, of his presidency uh, pushing for social reform and does not happen. We do, however, see an increase in the minimum wage. That helps uh, people in the lower class, as well as increased funds for public housing. Housing by those that are, that are in public housing in urban areas. So we see in this new frontier, some things getting done, but in general, a lot of his stuff is getting pushed back on. What he does, though, is he strengthens the presidency in a very Jacksonian-esque way. He's not president long enough to actually, I mean, he's president long enough. He doesn't get a ton of stuff done legislatively, but he does strengthen the executive branch. JFK demands much more presidential control. Uh, his White House staff, the people that are, that are around him, are going to be responsible for a lot of decisions that are going to be very important. Um, and, and what he starts this legacy of, though, is presidents picking people around them that are very, very qualified. All right, uh, his, his staff are often referred to as the new frontiersmen. Uh, he's the first president to really reach into academics to get people from uh, expertise in non-politics areas. So people that are economic experts, political experts, social experts. Um, uh, in, a, in a way that we've not really seen presidents do. Uh, and we really refer to his staff as, as the best and the brightest, is how they're referred to as. How they're referred to as. As, as he surrounds himself by other young, Harvard educated, really qualified, uh, intelligent, expertise type people uh, to really try to, to consolidate power in the executive branch to get a lot of things done. Cool. So, what I'm going to do is actually I want to stop here because there's three minutes left. There's three minutes, but I don't want to start Kennedy's foreign policy because I won't be anywhere near finishing Kennedy's foreign policy. But I will pick that back up in Vietnam next week, so don't worry about it necessarily. Uh, so what I will do, though, is I'll pass out to your period eight timeline. If I do not pass out on uh, Monday, I apologize. Again, 